to Boston Medical Center, um, and uh, thank you, Governor Healy, for convening this important conversation. Um, I'd like to start by just extending my gratitude to the governor, the lieutenant governor, Secretary Augustus, and Secretary Walsh, always thankful, uh, for their leadership in housing and, uh, and their recognition that housing is healthcare. Um, we know that investing in housing is critical, uh, long-term investment in health across the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, uh, BMC, one in 12 patients uh, we see in our hospital is experiencing homelessness, and far more are experiencing housing instability. We also know that mass health patients who experience homelessness have significantly higher rates of chronic and uh, life-altering diseases, including substance use disorder and significant mental illness. You'll hear from my, my colleagues, BMC is uh, very focused on both uh, what we term downstream and upstream solutions to address the root causes of he poor health outcomes in our communities, and housing instability is near the top. We're working hard, uh, but as a state, uh, we need to act at a scale that's proportionate uh, to the need. Um, so investing in housing, as uh, the, the Governor's Affordable Homes Act proposes, uh, is an investment in health and well-being of our patients and communities and for BMC for our employees. In addition to funding thousands of new affordable housing units, uh, the bill establishes a supportive housing pool that would make financing uh, supportive uh, housing units easier. We know from our direct experience uh, that this model which combines case management and housing helps some of our most complex patients become healthier and stay in their homes. We also applaud the uh, real estate transfer tax, uh, which would allow cities and towns to raise additional money uh, for affordable housing in their communities. It's a really important uh, tool to, for cities to have available if they so choose. So overall, we, uh, we know that making affordable housing more accessible in Massachusetts will make our communities healthier uh, and stronger. Uh, so welcome again, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and I'm excited to hear uh, the discussion and think about how we might continue the important work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know that I need a Sorry. microphone. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bell, and to the team here at BMC for hosting us. Uh, at least one of us knows her way around <laughs> these parts pretty well. Um, you know, thank you to, to all of you for being here, um, for the work that you do, and especially what you've shown over the last uh, few years now. Um, so much work and uh, so much effort, and I also appreciate that your teams have been under and continue to be under tremendous stress and strain. There are workforce challenges, capacity challenges, all of which we're mindful of and working on and we'll work on together. Today is a focus on housing. And I know that, you know, it intersects uh, in, in a couple of spaces. It's, you know, I, I think of housing as really a health equity issue for all the reasons that, that you just spoke to. Um, secure housing, a roof over one's head, um, habitable housing in terms of safe conditions free of mold, free of lead, other pollutants. Um, what that stability security means and results in, in terms of health trajectory and outcomes. You're all on the front lines on all of this and you get it and we get it too. Um, it's, it's really, really important. We're also pleased to talk not just about affordable housing, the rehabilitation of public housing which is also part of what this important bond bill will do. Creation of more supportive housing, creation of net zero clean energy focused housing that will have a particularly disproportionate positive impact in lower income communities, communities of color, all with an equity lens through something else we're proposing, the creation for the first time ever of an office of fair housing. This is so, so important. It's also so important 
your institutions, your community health centers, our teaching hospitals, our research institutions, they go because of the people <laughs> working there. And we need those people to be able to, to afford to live in our communities and in Massachusetts. So that's the other part of this, your ability to recruit, to retain talent, your ability to ensure that you have people across the spectrum able to fulfill needed positions to run your uh, operations and deliver health care turns on housing. So we welcome the conversation today. And with that, I'll turn it over to our good friend and amazing uh, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Thank you, Governor. It's, it's definitely a privilege to be able to spend some time with each of you knowing how busy your lives are as healthcare leaders running complex institutions and serving so many of the most vulnerable members of our communities. And I, I know you're here because you've seen, you've documented, you've addressed uh, daily sometimes the impact of housing insecurity on health conditions in our state. Um, I think this fact really has been part of our journey uh, in terms of addressing housing. We have see this as a priority in all the ways the governor just laid out. The goals of our administration are to make Massachusetts more competitive, more equitable, more affordable. And housing is where the rubber hits the road on all of those fronts, not only being key to the social determinants of health, but it's our biggest affordability issue. It's our biggest equity issue. It's our biggest threat to competitiveness when it comes to the talent recruitment and growing the workforce. And you all are facing those challenges in all of their various forms and your voices really matter. I think one of the reasons we are so grateful to be here is to underscore the importance of your voice in this debate about housing. Our biggest threat to addressing housing is our, ourselves. Can we go big enough? Can we put the resources together? Can we make sure we're meeting our community's needs across all levels from serving our most vulnerable populations with supportive housing? We haven't hit our silver tsunami in terms of uh, being able to age in place with dignity and respect. We haven't hit the apex of the baby boomers. How do we think about market rate housing and housing for the 500,000 students that are graduating this month? Um, that's our challenge collectively. And your voices in that really matter. I speak from experience when Dave Robinson came to, um, um, Doug Robert, Dave Robertson <laughs> came to our uh, zoning board meeting, like the president of Salem Hospital came and talked about ADUs. It mattered. People said, oh, okay, we get this. And so I just want to say how grateful we are to be here to hear from you and to be able to rely on you as allies in sharing why this housing issue is confronting all of us in every community across the Commonwealth. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the person we have been fortunate enough to work with, um, creating a whole new secretariat just to focus on housing and livable communities, Secretary Ed Augustus. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor and Governor. It's great to be with you all uh, here. I'm anxious to hear insights and some of the ways that the housing crisis has affected not only the folks you serve but the folks that you employ uh, and some of the challenges that presents to you to deliver the kind of key health care services uh, to our communities across Massachusetts. As the governor referenced, the bill that she filed back in October is the largest health, uh, the largest housing bill in the history of the Commonwealth, $4.1 billion investment in all of the key programs that we use to create affordable housing to preserve public housing and our other existing housing stock, as well as 28 policy changes, significant policy changes. Uh, Dr. Bell referenced the transfer fee, which is an opportunity for us to put dollars in the local community's hands so they're able to be a partner with us in the uh, creation and preservation of affordable housing. Uh, we looked at last year, Boston, Worcester, and Springfield, the three largest cities in the state had that option. 75 million dollars in those three cities uh, to support affordable uh, housing. Uh, so that's a huge tool in our local communities. Lots of ADUs, accessory dwelling units. First five years, eight to ten thousand units can be created at no expense to the Commonwealth. Uh, that provides options for folks who need to downsize but want to stay in the community and currently have nowhere to go. Uh, so there's a lot of policy that complements the significant dollars in this bill. Those combined with the tax credits that were part of the bill the governor signed uh, over the summer that significantly increased our LIHEC on low income housing tax credits, which are a real uh, powerhouse in creating affordable housing, as well as the conversations that are going on in cities and towns all across the state with the implementation of the MPA to deal with that, which is critical to removing some of the historic barriers to creating housing and get transit uh, exactly where we need it. All of those things in concert are really going to allow us to move in uh, on housing production and preservation uh, and meet the market for this significant challenge. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague.
no introduction <laughs> here or to this group, uh, Secretary Walsh. Thanks, Ed. I, I was, you know, reflecting on being in this room, um, one without the benefits of slides or an income statement <laughs> to have to talk about, so uh, glad to be back. Um, it's great to see so many uh, colleagues and friends here. But I think the, uh, the great, uh, wonderful privilege I've had um, in the last year working for, for Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll is going across the state and learning about the housing challenges around our state. And I think we've got colleagues here from Northampton, Cape Cod. We have people who represent community health centers and, and, and PACE programs and everything in between. It's going to take that kind of combined effort to come up with a, a, you know, a number of solutions that will be, um, that will, will, will help our state continue to thrive and, and people who live here flourish. I, um, you know, I have the privilege of, of asking also the first question, um, which relates back to, you know, I, I, I've had a lot of anxious moments in this room, and I've also learned a lot in this room, and I've learned a lot from my colleagues, uh, Megan and Thea. We want to talk to you a little bit about the work that came out of the, the thinking you've done here at BMC um, on housing security and talking about, you know, a vaccine. You know, is there a vaccine for housing? Like, what, like, like is, is, it, is it that important to how we care for patients that we should think about it in those terms? And maybe start with that. Well, uh, thank you. Welcome, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll and Secretary Augustus, and it's great to see you, Kate. Um, I think we think of housing as a vaccine because it keeps you healthy now and in the future. And so as an academic medical center, we actually tested that. We actually tested that with a randomized controlled trial. In 2016, a research policy network here at Boston Medical Center uh, paired an affordable housing unit with Boston Housing Authority with supportive services. And what we saw was amazing, and we actually published our results in Health Affairs in 2020, the first author of which is Alison Bovell Ammon, who is here in this <laughs> office. And, um, yeah. and so, and so, she, and so she I have to here. give her a shout out because yeah. uh, in a lot of ways, what we showed is that it works, right? After six months, we saw that kids were 32% less likely to be in fair or poor health. Their parents significantly reduced anxiety and depression scores. And then we took those results and then we said, we need to do this for medically complex adults. And we built out a living well at home program and the Medicaid program now is able to start to pay for that. And so one of the great things that we are thinking about is what are the ways in which this is not just a business model, this is the right thing to do. And so that's why we are really excited about the bond bill because it meets the moment. We are in today to try to do this. But I think that housing is not just about four walls, it's about the communities that it's in. And I wanted to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Dr. Thea James, to talk more about our community upstream work. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, uh, for being here with us today. Um, so it's no, um, we are not confused about what it requires for our patients to thrive. Things like housing, something like this is indeed healthcare, as, um, as uh, Dr. Bell said. And um, we actually had an opportunity, and, and housing, of course, is fundamental, it's foundational. Um, when we are trying to engage our patients in, in, in their health, we have to propose something that is of value to them you know, asking them to keep their appointments and to come back and this type thing is not necessarily a value to them when they're unhoused, for example. Um, and so, um, but once you do that, once you actually provide them with something like that, um, the utilization goes down, the cost goes down, all of those things, and their health gets better. And so actually, uh, thanks to the state, back in 2017, when we had a DON um, obligation, um, we were the first hospital to actually propose um, uh, uh, to invest our entire obligation in one social determinant of health, which was, happened to be housing. You know, some of it was um, uh, housing, investing in housing projects, some of it was in housing support services, um, and some of it was a hybrid. And we also had the opportunity to even invest in some small businesses that happened to be associated with housing that was um, being you know, developed on top of it, which actually um, satisfied more than just housing people. You know, it enabled, um, focused on helping to build uh, a more inclusive, sustainable local economy by um, the, uh, the business owners you know, being able to own a business and uh, also to own the space and to uh, provide healthy food to people. And also focuses on a really, really um, 
uh, deep and probably number one root cause, which is economics, you know, for people, for our, for our, and particularly our patients, is what they're focusing on. So um, uh, uh, I just want to say thank you for that, because that gave us an opportunity. The other thing it did was to um, encourage our other partners, our other um, uh, hospital partners, um, and we now sit at tables together, and we do that together on many levels now. So, and I would say the state now has an expectation of us to invest in that way. Um, maybe, maybe we 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 sort of touch on health. Pop. I'm going to maybe ask Anne and Mike to talk a little bit about uh, housing for workforce, and maybe Lynette too. You know, all of you are in um, are in areas where housing is expensive, where it's hard to recruit staff, hard to retain staff, and it's a little bit different on Cape Cod than it is in Northampton, but the same issues obtain. Actually, this, this world right here, you guys are all lined up perfectly, but, but, but right. it, because it's, it's a business imperative, and how do we, how do we, the state, help you need it? Because you can't take care of people. Without no, we, we can't yeah. take care of people without people. staff, and you know, given the capacity crisis, given all the needs, uh, given all the turnover in staff, we know all this. Uh, lack of housing, lack of affordable housing, transportation to that housing is an enormous challenge. You know, so for Mass General Brigham, we have about 84,000 employees, uh, and what's interesting about that is that the majority of them are working in Boston. So if you look at Mass General, and you look at the Brigham, and you look at the Faulkner, and there's Mass Zioneer, it's Boston. So we are very, very concentrated, tens and tens of thousands of people. And they range from physicians and nurses and technicians and administrators. You've got a broad variety of people. And the bulk of the workforce are people who cannot afford to, to live anywhere near here. So I would say it's a huge challenge. And, and when we're talking about patients, it's the same thing for workforce. You can't think about it unless you think about it at scale and how there's a spectrum of this. There are people who fundamentally can't afford to, uh, to live, to have a place to live. That, that's one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are really having trouble maintaining where they are living. So it's a huge spectrum. But the need, the basic need to have affordable, safe housing in places where they can live, where their children can go to school, that's everywhere. So we need to keep thinking about this, and in terms of Massachusetts, and in terms of the innovation economy, and bringing people here, the great scientists, the teachers, the doctors, the everybody, we are going to be less attractive to people, and we are losing those people in the workforce because they simply can't afford to live here. So I would just say it is a huge problem, it's a growing problem, we are working very hard on it, but I want to thank all of you sitting here at the table for taking a government broad approach to this because we can advocate, uh, we can support the legislation, and we do that vigorously. We do whatever we can within our own healthcare system, but we are very dependent on working collaboratively together. Not all of the same solutions will apply to the workforce as they do for patients, but the, the scope of it and the expanse of what we need to do is, is actually very much aligned. If you don't have the workforce, you can't take care of the patients. So. Lynette, why don't you start? Well, thank you, and really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. And, and, you know, a personal story, um, I came here and I trained here, and I was on faculty and, uh, at uh, one of our uh, esteemed areas here. And I left, I came back because the opportunity was here. Because Team Massachusetts, mm -hmm. that's what they say, is incredibly strong team to be on. But the biggest barrier, and it still is for a lot of our workforce, and for me personally when I came back, was housing. We talk about it coolly, workforce access and value. We can't provide the access which is a key component of high quality care without the workforce. And we have to be as attractive as possible in order to retain the best and the brightest because we're competing nationally. We also focus on the value of care, access is that component too. But we have to realize, and we saw this in our community health needs assessment in, in Northampton, that housing is key. We are a rural community that really 
relies on transportation and aged um, housing stock. We have about 30% of our houses that are over, uh, that are uh, before 1950s are old and they need to be refitted. And in Franklin County, it's even higher. It's about 40%. We have to take that into consideration because in, in instability in housing means instability in healthcare, instability in food access, which contributes to all of the things that we take care of in our acute care facilities and beyond. So we are very focused on this. So maybe I'll go to one of the mics, talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, Cape Cod. Well, thank you, Secretary Walsh, uh, Governor Healy, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, uh, Secretary Augustus, thanks for having us today. I really appreciate your championing the, the housing situation and issues in the Commonwealth. Right now, we have over 5,200 employees at Cape Cod Healthcare, 18% of which have to commute across our bridges. And thank you as well, Governor, for your support of our aging bridges. Um, <laughs> housing is a very real issue for us. Right now, one of three physicians choose not to come to us because of the cost of housing. One in five people, all of our employees can't come to us because of the price of housing. And I always felt in my heart that the market could respond to the issues at hand. And what I now know is it can't and it won't. So that's where I think your involvement and your direction and our mutual partnership can really meet that need. And what I worry most about is really our rank and foul employees that are taking care of our incredible citizens in our community that have to pick up two and three extra shifts per week to afford the increases that their landlord just passed along. That's not living. It's reacting. And our pledge is to work not only cooperatively with you, but also our community. We know as part of our mission is to take care of everybody, and our vision is to partner with others to ensure that we meet that mission. We can do that with great institutions like the Housing Assistance Corporation of Cape Cod, all of our community health centers, Duffy, that handles our homelessness issues. Partnering together to create comp really, really meaningful solutions, and we will follow BMC's lead. We are building a, a little project on the Cape that will really result in about $8 million worth of DON money that we really pledge to throw into the housing situation on the Cape and make sure that our workforce has meaningful, affordable housing but as well as our community. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Mike. Maybe we'll come back to employers, but I wanted, I wanted to kind of switch. We've, we've done the diagnosis. I'd like to switch a little bit to the therapy, and I'm looking at um, our colleagues from the Health Center world who often have the, the, the scope and the, and the connections in their community to create meaningful solutions. So maybe, uh, could, 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 you, could you describe a little bit of the work you're doing in Lynn as a start? Or Michael, I, I don't, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, so what we're seeing um, at Lynn is no different than what we're seeing across um, um, different neighborhoods and communities where um, we are seeing patients that are not having the baseline information because they're not, um, um, they don't have that, that housing security. So as an example, sometimes uh, they don't know the difference between the ER, urgent care, or wellness visit. So our providers and care teams are spending that much more time in patient education. Um, we're finding that um, you know housing being the single biggest driver in disinvestment and disengagement in the community, the, the, the sense of community health is being compromised. And so uh, we have um, uh, an increasing number of patients that are dealing with uh, really compromised and poor environmental conditions in the home, and, um, and we're seeing that in their respiratory asthma conditions. Um, we're seeing the impacts of temporary housing um, where our patients cannot really um, take care of their medications the way they need to. And then in the most acute cases um, where we are seeing totally uh, unhoused um, individuals and families where they are completely disengaged with care. And um, what um, we're required to do and what we need to do and what we are doing is providing really what, it, what we call concierge services. So everything from stirrups and a mobile van that we have um, to deal with OB um, moms um, to get them the prenatal care they need while they're dealing with addiction um, to providing Suboxone treatment in the mobile van um, to in a soup kitchen, we actually have a clinic set up there. Um, we have 20 bed respite center, and this is all in our little community here, right? And so um, we have um, do case management where um, our community members can come and take showers 
And so uh, this issue of housing really um, impacts every area of um, our community life. And as a community health center, I'm looking for us not to just track visits and patients, but also uh, to track our community health and what is the measure for that. And so thank you today very much for your partnership in helping us um, improve health outcomes. And, I, and the kind of creative solutions that support people who are unhoused or, or maybe maybe Jay and, and Jennifer could talk a little bit about PACE as a solution as well. It's, it's, but it keeps people in their homes in a, in a very, you know, a lot of support to keep people housed in a different way. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, we really, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak on, on behalf of the aging population. Um, and for those that aren't aware, um, PACE serves as P program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. We serve individuals 55 and above who meet the nursing home level of care, which sounds like a very high bar, but it's not really that high. Um, as Dr. Bell indicated, people's chronic conditions are advancing and they're aging and they need more supports to remain in the community. We serve 271 cities and towns and we're growing. You might have heard of um, a PACE program being embedded in the new Brighton J.J. Carroll location, but that is the tip of the iceberg of what PACE can do within housing partnerships. Um, with Leading Age and Executive Office of Elder Affairs, we um, wrote a guide around some of the different partnerships that exist in that PACE programs actually have floors within senior housing where they embed 24-7 care to keep those individuals in the community because even if you don't necessarily uh, need somebody to be there and help you at that moment, you might need that level of supervision. And if you need somebody overnight, the housing is not going to be able to do that for you. The other thing that it really helps is the housing folks are not healthcare individuals. So as those needs are changing, they can't meet them. And so we're helping them meet those needs and keep people in the community. Um, I think one of the opportunities uh, for us is, you know, we face just like everybody else does as people's needs change and perhaps we need to get them into a more supportive environment, not having that housing stock. Um, Secretary Walsh, you know, we're dealing of course with assisted livings that close and nursing facilities that close and they have to go somewhere. Um, so I think what our hope would certainly be is one, to you know, encourage housing partners like we saw with Two Life Communities to incorporate um, integrated, comprehensive, the creme de la creme of addressing social determinants of health with both primary care and all of the other interdisciplinary teams within those models. But also can we reimagine and repurpose perhaps because we need some of these things as soon as possible. Could we repurpose some of these house homes that have closed um, could there be opportunities for things like rest homes or small homes to revamp those buildings and allow for some opportunity for people to get housed, get out of nursing homes and get off of the streets? So um, we're really excited about this opportunity and uh, hope we can help. Thank you. Community as well. Uh, at Upham's Pace, uh, speaking and building off of what Jen had mentioned is in 2012, we actually did partner with Boston Housing Authority to create a supportive housing unit, which is co-located with one of our pay centers in JP. Fast forward to 2016, 2017, we actively worked with the city of Boston with their homeless surge, and we were able to house 35 individuals uh, with that support of the city. And of those 35 individuals, we enrolled all 35 and all but one actually remained in the PACE model until they until they passed on. And then, most recently, we are actually working with uh, neighborhood development corporations like JPNDC and even Hebrew Senior Life in trying to come up with creative models. And for us, we just ask that we, we continue to work with um, the housing authorities out there as well as some of these developers and creating that partnership with them because they're the ones who are the experts in building these, lo these locations and we just want to make sure that they understand that housing is healthcare as well and afford them that opportunity to create that pathway for the individuals in our community to get access to the care. So I'm going to ask Michael Curry to take this and pick up on something Thea said, which is relates to community. Part of this, part of these, these conversations are really about helping us understand what's needed in community, but it's also helping communities understand the benefit of this. And lots, everybody wants housing and everybody wants affordable housing and every place we go, people ask us about it. But then 
you know, when we actually go to try to cite it, there's a, it's, it can be a different conversation. So, so Thea, you referenced that, that, that safe, affordable housing builds community. So why is there so much resistance and how can we break through it? And how can we take the, the powerful statements we've heard in this room and translate it into support for the funding and the change it's gonna take to have this bill get passed and, and, these, and, and more importantly, these units built? Yeah, so, so it's funny, I, as I walked in today, I was thinking, where would I start when Kate asked me a question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's interesting. I know you're a very persuasive guy, so <laughs> I thought I'd start with this. The, the, the place I would start is that almost 60 years ago, um, activist physicians like Jack Geiger, Count Gibson, Dr. John Hatch, who I was just on the phone with recently, out of Tufts Medical, were thinking about these issues. They were actually trying to figure out how to solve this very problem that housing is health. They were talking about social determinants of health before we got there as a society talking about it. Um, and they got resistance, um, whether it was Columbia Point in Boston or Bolivar County in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, there was always resistance because of course, some of these things are systemic, that we don't invest in, um, in the right places to address things that we will pay for later. Uh, and you heard me say, uh, pay now or pay greater later. I can keep you healthy now and keep you out of our emergency rooms and keep you from uh, dying too soon so that you're not building our next trains for our train stations and, and doing that work. We don't do that very well. Um, and I would argue uh, part of what the conversation I had with Jack Geiger was that, that that took a lot of work to convince people to invest in what makes you sick. Um, Rebecca Lee Crumplin, and forgive me for those who hear me say this all the time, first African-American female physician 1864. From this school. Exactly. Um, history that everyone should know. Uh, she said they seem to forget there's a cause for every ailment and it may be in their power to remove it. I sat in this very, these buildings as a kid with asthma almost every quarter to get treatment. Um, my sisters, my mother, we lived in this building once Boston City, Boston City Hospital because we couldn't breathe. Uh, and it was roaches and rats and Linden Street housing projects. Um, and we weren't alone. Almost everybody in our neighborhood was sick. Um, so whether it's the inadequacy of our housing or whether it's the fact that we are investing in housing, because so many around us were not stable housing. The, the other thing I would say is this. I think it's interesting from a community health center perspective. I'm honored to be here with colleagues who are doing phenomenal work. Um, I have my entire leadership team traveling the state from Hilltown to Berkshires, North Shore, South Shore, something we've never done as an entire leadership team. And every conversation is on housing. And it is the two-fold conversation. We can't recruit and retain them because they don't, can't come here because they can't afford it. <coughs> and that's every community. Or um, our patients can't afford to live here. And they can't afford to prioritize their health because they're dealing with housing. Um, I, I think this is gonna require, and I'm, I'm so thankful to the governor, lieutenant governor and administration, bold solutions. And this is the beginning of getting people to the table and say, how do we do this disruptive approach to housing like Jack Geiger, like, like Count Gibson and the rest did. Otherwise, we will see these inequities, these disparities persist. We have an opportunity to do that. I think of the bond bill, I think the conversation uh, has been rich and I'm looking forward to participating in it. Thank you. So I have one more question then, then uh, uh, I think LG's been texting me, so I'll just, I just wanna follow up on one thing. Yeah, go, um, go, go. I, I, we're, we're all here because we support housing, right? I mean, in our actions. So how do we have more evangelists at the local level and how do we really leverage all of you? And many of you are the largest employers in your communities and that's a lot of people. And how do we put them to work knowing that we don't build housing, it gets built in communities and you all read in the newspapers, there's some challenges. Like we have to capture hearts and minds. And so I'd be, is there a role for us to leverage your staff to help in the communities they live, to empower them to educate them, to understand what's at stake? And are there things that we should be thinking about differently? Co-locating housing on, on hospital campuses, uh, co-locating housing on educational institutions. And we are trying to play offense. Like we're done admiring the problem and I'm just would love to sort of facilitate any ideas or thoughts you have on any of those notions. If I can pitch to Steve Walsh, because we just talked about this on the way in. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in there. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, if, we, if we were to, um, when we now um, survey our patients that they come in, they talk about three things, housing instability, food insecurity, and transportation. And when we 
talked about workforce, they talk about three things. Housing instability, child care, and transportation. So two of the three overlap for sure, and housing is the one. So in terms of the connected tissue of the problem, how do you get the, 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 the member of the public that's waiting six hours in the emergency department to understand that that wait is actually a housing problem? Because we have 19,000 open positions in Massachusetts hospitals, and if we can't get people to live here and to work here, we can't serve the needs of our patients and the needs of our community. So in terms of the bold ideas, right, it is no surprise that if we're gonna be successful in healthcare and disrupt healthcare, we're gonna be delivering more, more services outside of the walls of the hospital. That leaves buildings that are set up as dorms with long hallways and a nurse's station and individual rooms. There's housing opportunities there. In terms of our workforce challenge, marrying our housing problem, we, we could and should be looking at a big bold idea, you said, like a campus where we're not only housing our workforce but training the next generation of workforce in housing settings. And these are the types of things that the people in this room historically have not come together to talk about, and thanks to the leadership of this administration, we are. But those are the solutions that could have incredible opportunity for us to, to treat our patients better so we're a healthier community, but also take care of our workforce, which is, as Michael said, I mean, they're they are doing it, and they've been doing it since pre-COVID, um, and they're still doing it today, and they're treating sicker people, and those jobs are harder and harder, and they do it every day for the people that we love and care about it. We have a responsibility, I think, to, to give them an opportunity to be able to live and work within the communities that they love and live in. I just maybe add two things. Um, one is um, patients really want to get care closer to home. We know this. Um, we know that as a state, we have fewer outpatient facilities per population number than pretty much anyone else in the country. We know this. We also know we have a huge challenge in terms of a workforce, housing, and all the things we're talking about. So the only, so there are two things. Number one is pushing more care out into community sites, into community hospitals, into the communities. The more we do that, the more there will be an interest in developing and investing in those local communities, and that includes healthcare, housing, all of the supporting things. Because again, for us, localizing so much of this in downtown Boston just escalates the challenge for patients and for our workforce. I think the second point is, is bundling a lot of the messages together. So this was touched on, it's really generational health. We're really talking about generational health for patients and also for our employees. And when you put it all together, you also have to think about, and Michael mentioned this, it's children, it's families, education, because when you talk about housing and health care, education is right there. So again, I think thinking about this in terms of where are families going to get education for their children, where are they living, where are they getting health care, we can put those together. I think it's also helpful in getting a lot more attention from our employees, because they will start to think about it in the way they think about their own lives. And I think to your question, we will likely get a lot more pick up interest, passion mm -hmm. from employees who are living this every day. They, I don't think they're thinking about it as holistically as, as they can. And, and maybe, maybe Jim, because I, if I don't call on somebody from Worcester, Ed will beat me up yeah. after the. Uh, <laughs> but Jim, maybe talk a little bit about, and then maybe Mike follow up for for Springfield. Like, are there are there different solutions or things that are emerging within your community where there's maybe a little more breathing room or? Um, Although I just read that it's the it's the most challenged, the, the shortest housing market in this in this state. Yeah, I was going to say for Worcester, there's really no breathing room. Um, we are, as people may have seen, the, the third worst. Um, rental market in the nation. And that's something that as somebody who grew up there and has lived there pretty much my whole life, it's very surprising to say. But what we've seen is that sort of migration from greater Boston as well as the normal immigration into Worcester that has, you know, on a positive note, and this was under Secretary Augustus's leadership, really, you know, brought about tremendous development and a great vibe in the city that we have not seen in the 57 years that I've been alive. But the flip side of that coin is how expensive it is. So the, it, it's got the second lowest vacancy rate in the nation. And I believe it's third in terms of the actual increase in, in monthly rent. So what we're seeing on an employment side is it makes it difficult both to recruit employees because people are moving out of the city and they don't have the transportation to come 
movements, they're moving mostly towards the west. And then for our, our existing employees, we have the same dynamic, which was just brought up by Steve, where you have the issue of affordability, childcare, et cetera, and the transportation issue is especially challenging because the, the WRTA and the transit authorities in the region have limited service. So if you're in the city, it's great. Once you get out into the, into the western regions, it becomes very difficult to get into Worcester. So we see it with employees, we see it with patients. Um, and, and I would like to, to the Lieutenant Governor's point, in terms of advocacy, I think there's, there's a lot of strength simply in saying that you are from a hospital, you're from a healthcare institution, and to point out that, that housing is a social determinant of health. Because we all know it, but to the, to the larger world out there, they don't know it. I, I'm someone who pretty much almost flunked chemistry in high school, so I have absolutely no medical knowledge. But because UMass Memorial is next to my name, we could advocate for inclusionary zoning, we could advocate for the establishment of an affordable housing trust fund in Worcester, which the Secretary, Secretary uh, Augustus was a leader on. And it really, just by virtue of us being involved institutionally, I think it helped, you know, and it, and it definitely drew some attention to it. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Governor, Senate Governor, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for your leadership on the issue. Obviously, this is a moment in time, and which is critical for the, the future of the Commonwealth. You know, for Springfield, it has one of the oldest housing stocks in the state by average, and you know, part of it is obviously the issue of scalability. There just simply is not enough in Springfield. One of the things when I, I first came to Bayston and I learned was that you know, many of our medical residents actually have housing in Connecticut, northern Connecticut. We're so close, so I took a drive down there <coughs> actually to see the uh, facility in Connecticut, which is you know, fine, but it ought to be in Massachusetts, and it ought to be able to house in Springfield downtown livability. And so the bill that you propose clearly goes a long way in so many ways to, to help uh, on that down payment to make sure that there are, are places within the community. We did a lot of research over the years on, on asthma, childhood asthma, the incidence of asthma in the Pioneer Valley, which is one of the most acute in, in, in the state, and uh, we used a, lot, a number of our community benefit dollars to, re, to incentivize community programs and community partners on Revitalize, Revitalize Springfield, Wayfinders, the groups you know, uh, New North Citizens Council and others, and on that midstream level of investment. And it's gone a long way, but again, it's the, the scalability of all that in a community that um, has some very negative social vulnerability index. An interesting thing we did do recently, and it's on the adding evangelists to the cause, and having spent a little time in the State House, on the upstream level, our, our academic partner is UMass Medical School, as you know, we're the western campus of, of the school, and the doctors chose housing as one of the areas, the new doctors, the new students, as one of the areas that they wanted to focus on from an influencing public policy. So we brought them to the State House with the community partners, so not the doctor alone, not talking about medical issues or physician issues or workplace issues of their own, but talking about what they see in the community health centers in Springfield, what they see up in Greenfield, um, and, and how they could help influence the lives of their patients through influencing public policy. Public policy we chose, Madam Governor, uh, was in fact your housing bond bill and the Healthy Homes Initiative, which resonated very powerfully with them, with the, with the, uh, the patients that they see almost every day. So, so on that upstream element, there's a great opportunity, I think, with the young people who are so focused on the social determinants of health. So again, thank you for your leadership for all you have done uh, in this space. So, so we've been around the state. Let's end in Boston. This will only take us home. <laughs> <laughs> That um, you know we've experienced here in Boston as we try to improve our you know availability of, of affordable housing, which is of course a challenge. I guess I wanted to take this in a slightly different direction and think about those individuals who are chronically homeless and the situation that we're dealing with, uh, particularly in this area, as we're all aware. I'm sure as we drove up, individuals who are you know either on the streets or they're in corners, alleyways, they have nowhere to go, and we're trying very hard with partners like BMC, with partners like Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, like our community health centers, like MGB, who's doing a lot of work um, in this area in Nubian and other areas that where we're, where we're facing these challenges, to really figure out how to get people into not only housing, but thinking housing plus, so permanent supportive housing and keeping them there, you know? Because 
if you look at the number of people that we moved into our low threshold housing program, and that's the program where we have folks who, you know, are still um, are, are using and they are, you know, offered uh, a roof over their head and services if they if they wish to, to take them. It's been about 600 in the last two years, and only about a third of them have moved on to permanent supportive housing because there's not enough of it, because there's NIMBYism, because there's not enough money for it. Because when you think about all the services that somebody who's chronically housed, who has not um, lived in a space by themselves for years, years, for decades for some people, actually need to actually stay stable in a house, and you think about how much that costs, that's where we run into a, a, a severe roadblock. But that's what we need to keep people housed, and we know that there are people who are bouncing right back onto the street. So thinking, okay, housing is a first step, but what more do we need? And I know all of us around the table know this, but it's just, I appreciate this bill because it does talk about that, and it really thinks about how we can enhance those services for individuals through the Supportive Housing Pool Fund, and I'm, I'm really impressed that that's a, that's a true um, structural change that I, I, I'm very much so supportive and want to just want us to emphasize, because I do think it's not just about the house, not just about the roof over their heads, all the services that go along with it. Okay, I want to thank you. I, I think we're out of time, but I do remember I referenced at the outset all the things I learned in this room, and one of the things I learned was from Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, where somebody pulled me aside after a meeting and said, you know, Kate, it's more than just a key. So with that, I'll turn it back to the governor G if they have anything they want to add. I just want to um, just, I would just leave here with a prompt to, and a, maybe a bit of a challenge. We need action in this space. You all have such incredible opportunities to help get the action we need at the local level in places. Do not sell yourself short in terms of mobilizing staff, mobilizing campus activities, and showing up in those places where it's hard to build housing that we all know we need, including the folks there. And so I would ask you to think about what can we do out and after this? Uh, we're working on a bill, we're gonna continue to try and fund all that we can, but we need action and your opportunities to, to be action oriented will help us get there. Um, thank you. And just for context, we're doing this in different rooms with different groups around the state because it is about the team and everybody, everybody in this state has an interest in seeing more housing. So I forget where we were this week. Yesterday we were the business leaders? Western. All the chambers. Yeah. Okay? Had a similar conversation. And the call, the same call was made. Go to the zoning board meeting. Go to your town meeting. Speak up. Articulate. Everybody can speak from their own realm why this matters. We've got an event with Secretary Santiago, who we are still allow to take shifts over here. I'm told, right? Um, with veterans and veterans groups, right? Uh, we're doing this with all of you. We got more. Like we can't talk enough about housing, and we know the moment we're in right now, and we've got to make as a state some important decisions, but these are investments. I know we can do it. I know we can do it, but we've got to help those who actually have decision-making power, particularly at the local level, understand. I mean, it's amazing to me. You can't hire. One in, one in five people you want to hire, you can't hire. One in three docs. You know, the numbers of uh, the, the impact here, um, is just so, so significant. So thank you for convening today. I always learn so much from my amazing colleagues and from folks um, like you in rooms like this. Um, but but we really wanna, we really wanna tackle this and tackle it now as a state together. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah.